Welcome to the uh, Play Recreation and Sports Committee for the 17th of August. Sorry about the delay. We just a little bit of feedback. We've had a few technical problems. Um, so just to start off, we'll look, go through the housekeeping. Um, if the sound of an alarm goes off, please make it to the nearest exit, and we'll meet at the clock tower in the square. If uh, anything else is required. Admin will guide you through that. Um, this meeting will be recorded and streamed um, live on Council's YouTube channel to thousands around the Mutu. <coughs> I had to add that. Um, while Palmerston North is in COVID 19 procedures framework, um, orange setting. We ask everyone continue to follow public hygiene measures. Um, all online participants um, to keep cameras turned on and microphones muted, unless speaking. Um, councillors in person will use the uh, electronic uh, system to speak or vote. And now I will move to the agenda. Uh, and we'll start with apologies. I have apologies for Councillor Susan Batty, Councillor Dingwell, Councillor Bruno Petrinus, uh, early departure, Councillor Leone Harpeter uh, for early departure. And Councillor Johnson. Councillors online, Councillor Rachel Bowen, Councillor Pat Hancock, Councillor Ophi McAlad. Um, I'll move those apologies. I have a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Uh, ask you to vote. having problems with his device. And that is passed unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is notification of agen uh, additional items. I don't have any. Declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? No. Public comment. Is there any public comment? I am not aware of any. And that brings us to number five on our agenda presentations. And our first presentation <coughs> is from, is by uh, Karen Menon, 
um, Director of Park Run Palmerston North. So Karen, if you'd like to come up to the... Uh, Wendy Watts. Wendy Watts. Welcome, Wendy. So the process is you have 10 minutes for your presentation. And you can start whenever you're ready. Yeah, when he said I could actually talk about why I'm here, I said, no, that might, might be in my 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, nine minutes, eight minutes, seven minutes. Well, while we're waiting, how many of you have heard of Park Rum? <laughs> A couple of you? Yeah. All right, we're, okay. we're good to go. Okay, um, so I'll just introduce myself, I'm Karen Manninen and I'm one of the directors of Park Run and Wendy is another and we're not directors like a board, we're directors like we direct the event and uh, we, we all take turns, we're volunteers and uh, we go on a roster and we just say when we want to do it and hopefully the roster gets filled. So what is Park Run? Well it, for a start it's worldwide, um, it's inclusive, that's the biggest thing that it is, it's inclusive, everybody regardless of age, race, religion, Political persuasion, um, yeah, it's, it, it's inclusive. It's simple to run, so there's very little gear, um, which is important because um, it's non-profit and uh, we can't raise money. Uh, we had a um, defib um, donated by Rotary, Milks and Rotary, so that was pretty cool. We felt that was really important. It's always in public spaces. Um, there's one-time registration, which is also free, and you can then take that registration around the world which my husband and I have done. We ran a couple in Germany and we made the field most welcome and part of the Park Run family, which is one of the biggest things that it has going for it. We're not clicking on. Well, that's a good question. Let's have another go. Oh, we'll get our technical expert onto it. Oh, okay. Okay, so the big thing, as you can see by the picture of all those people, is um, participation. Um, we've had over 32,000 people run Park Run in Palmerston North, um, over 206 events, because we've been going for four years, and it's every Saturday at 8 o'clock near the Fitzhubert Bridge on the Hardy, Hardy Street Reserve. Um, we are fortunate now that we have a uh, limestone area a congregation area that the council put in, realising the importance of keeping us safe, keeping us off the path for as much as possible because we need to share the pathway. Uh, we always have around about 10 volunteers and 339 people have volunteered um, as from the 6th of this month. Now, obviously, they're not 339. Well, it says different people. I'm not too sure. But that's how many people have done it. Um, and people come and go. Uh, next one, please. So here's some photos showing the diversity, um, the young and the old, uh, the wheelchair, that's one of the great benefits of us having this park run on a paved surface, that basically everyone can do it. 
Um, even a little dog who can't run anymore or walk anymore because it's un not healthy can, can be there with it. So you can see the joy in the, in the people's face there. We're a, little bit, um, we're a little bit unique in that our park run is one of the only park runs that's completely paved and flat. So a lot of the park runs around New Zealand, you couldn't have somebody in a wheelchair on it. So you don't need any special equipment apart from some shoes? I mean, if, if you only walk it, then you just need everyday shoes. Um, different groups uh, come along um, and... As you see, different ages. The guy on the right, um, he, he came uh, first and then he brought um, his entire multi-generational family along. Next, please. The benefits of Park Run, there's, there's one huge benefit is our heora, our well-being. And um, we just want to um, explain that a little bit further. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So... Um, Sue Mason Jury has this wonderful model of um, heora, uh, the four dimensions. We have taha wairua, which is our spiritual dimension, taha hininaro, our mental and emotional, taha tihana, the physical dimension, and tana whānau, our family and social dimension. Next, please. So there's just some slides to show um, how that's all happening. All the people, those people have... As you see, they're sitting down, so that means they've been running. <laughs> they're not waiting to run. <laughs> Next, please. So as you can see, whole families, extended families. Um, it becomes a habit, which is great. Uh, the person on the right with the dress up on, that's her son. She's got two other sons um, and her husband. They run. Um, so the same guy that I said about brought his whole family there in the middle. Um, lots of families Buggies, baby in the buggy with the son running and little, little kids, they, they do the whole 5K, they, um, they walk a lot and they run fast and then they walk again. Um, next, please. And this is um, just uh, an excerpt from a um, sociologist, Van Lang and Columbus uh, article, book, um, and that it's a really important aspect is the social side of park run can be recognised in the way aspects of each event provide affordances for social interactions, where even fleeting encounters uh, with strangers, a greeting, a smile or very brief conversation can help serve basic needs, such as feeling connected and appreciated. And, you know, that's one of the things I know that the council is trying to do um, with, with the river. Next, please. And um, it's pretty much an accepted belief that um, when exercise is performed in a social environment and also in a green space, it has the most benefit. Um, reciprocity is present, so the park runners themselves, when they feel they've done it a few times and they start to feel comfortable, they then come back and um, next time they, uh, they volunteer. There are people that have done more volunteering than actual uh, running or walking. Um, it requires no specific equipment. Um, the volunteers, they come along with their smartphone, they can do timing on this, they do the timing on their smartphone, and also uh, scanning, because when you come through, you get a token that gets scanned with your registration, and then we have, uh, you get an email within a, a short while. If Wendy's doing it, it's like within five minutes of the event finishing. <laughs> And that gives you your time and your position and whether or not you've done a personal best and where you rank around the world in your age in terms of your uh, effort, which can be a lot. You can choose. You can run for a PB or you can choose to go at your pace and chat to everyone along the way, which is my preferred um, way of running or walking. Uh, next, please. Yeah, our fast ones run it in less than 15 minutes. So we have from less than 15 minutes to one hour. An hour, yeah. Everywhere in between. And even the guys that run 15, they don't do that every week. They'll pick no. a time where they're going to go for it, and other times they're just doing a training run. Yep. And, um, you know, they're as sociable as everybody else. So we want to talk about um, the sociality of the third space. I'm not sure it's, it's something that I haven't heard of before, but it just means where people are welcome to congregate and socially interact in an informal setting. Um, the potential to act as levelers, cultivating a space which is inclusive, free of any formal set criteria, which is really important because, you know, we know that numbers in clubs are 
lowering, you know, in New Zealand and around the world. People are not so keen to commit to formal things. So people don't have to pay uh, sub, they don't have to go on any committees, they just rock up when they want to, eight o'clock on a Saturday morning. Um, which, if you're used to sleeping in, is a bit tricky, but actually once you've done it, you, you just feel amazing for the rest of the day. Yeah, so it provides an important function in our community because they're accessible, convenient, and local. Lots of people actually see them walking along the way. I live further away, so I do drive, but yeah. Next, please. So our spiritual dimension, Taha Wairua, um, because we're by our awa, and it's beautiful. In the mornings, when it's frosty morning, there's this magical uh, feeling about it, and it, yeah, it's, it can be very spiritual. And that photo was taken from a park run morning. It's not something we've just pulled out of the air. That was taken by one of our photographers yeah. so at park run. We have a photographer every week, a volunteer who, who takes photos, and they all get posted on Facebook. Um, and people love to see themselves. Well, some people do. <laughs> <laughs> they love to see their families. Um, next one, please. The physical um, benefits of, of, uh, of running and walking, they're well known to you all, so I don't really need to, to do, talk too much about that. But we do get people that they realise that it's something that is attainable. You know, 5Ks, yeah, I can probably walk 5Ks. And um, they start off walking and we've had a lot of stories of people that um, have improved their physical health and have lost weight. Um, so that's, that's a really cool outcome. Next one, please. Yeah, the mental and emotional is our biggest uh, area, I think, where we offer something that perhaps other um, clubs and um, organisations um, perhaps we, we give more of that because of the environment. It's inclusive of age, culture, race, size, and friendliness. It's really friendly, and people encourage each other. People they don't know, they go, well done, or good work, or, you know, and especially the children. I mean, Wendy and I, we just, we just love encouraging the kids, but you have a person giving out a token to everyone that crosses the line, and there's always a positive word um, that's said to those people as they cross over. So every individual, you know, gets some sort of positive reinforcement. So it contributes to the feelings of worth and inclusivity, um, aspects which enhance self-esteem and confidence, leading to improved mental health. Next, please. Yeah, so we've talked about the volunteering aspect, and these are just some of the, um, uh, some of the volunteers. We always have a volunteer photo um, after everyone's run off, and we um, have a little bit of time till they come back. Um, you see the fellow in the wheelchair. Just look at his uh, T-shirt. A little sign on the back is the Park Run logo. When you've been volunteering for 25 times, you get a free T-shirt. Um, 50, another one. 100, I think, is another one. We've even got more now, haven't we? 25, 50, 100, 250, 500. Yeah. And we get so countries that have been going for 10 years, years. Yeah. there's some of their volunteers are way up there. You also get them for, um, for running Finish. those Finishing, events yeah. as well. Yeah. And there's no limit as to who can volunteer. So you can see there's kids can volunteer with a you know, parent alongside. Um, the disabil no disability will stop you from volunteering. We encourage volunteers. Karen, can I just, just remind you that your 10 minutes is up? OK. But, but if you've got things to wind up on, go well, ahead and do it. Yeah, I think we are done. Uh, can we oh, what we want, what we're after. Oh, yeah, what we want. OK, we want a sign, OK? <laughs> we want a sign. We want to buy our limestone area because um, safety issues. A lot of cyclists use the path. Some of them pretty aggro and they try and run us down. And we thought, if we have a sign, uh, then they'll know that we're there 8 o'clock Saturday and they could either go five minutes later or five minutes earlier and avoid the congestion. Because we have people on the limestone path, on the limestone area, and then when we're ready to go, we move them onto the path. And at that point, they block the path. Um, and then as they run off till they spread out, it's a little bit blocked. Uh, and also because the, council's in, the council itself is, um, what's the word, obliged to um, serve their citizens uh, as far as wellbeing goes. Um, next one, please. And the, and the council, it says that you want the river to be a destination for people, and, and we, are, we are drawing people to the river, to the Awa. Um, and 
you know, we're enhancing the physical connections with the river environment. Yep. Um, and, we, and we're engaging the community. And, you know, basically, that's what we do that nobody else does. It's free, it's weekly, organised, timed, inclusive. Right, right and uh, that's why we're different to everybody else. And that's why we should get a sign, even though you say people can't have a sign. So, yeah, thanks very much. I just want to finish with one statement to the founder, yeah. Paul Sinton Hewitt. His, he finished off with Park One may well be the most successful public health initiative of the 21st century, but is successful because it isn't a public health initiative. <coughs> and he was awarded CBE for his um, work in, in this area. Thank, thank you very thank much, you. ladies. Appreciate it. Councillors, are there any questions? Councillor Rutherford. Uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I don't think the queue is open for people to no. jump in. No, I can see that. Thank you, Karen and Wendy, for your presentation. I've got two questions. The first one is, if you're um, a free um, opportunity for people to participate, how do you fund your additional resources like your T-shirts and those sorts of things that are given away to people? OK, that's... Sponsors, yeah, basically, yeah, sponsors. And so, so, have you got formal? We've got so in New Zealand, we've something? got Ukanuba and um, Athletics Foot. Yeah, so Athletics Foot and Ukanuba are our sponsors at the moment. And are yeah. they localised to every individual park run set up, or are they global or national? It's national for us, um, and we do have so um, Athletics Foot will come down about three, four times a year, and have a, um, they set up and promote and support park runners, so they'll come up, talk about anything, shoes, yeah, but they provide funding for, and their sponsorship provides the, anything that we need, um, more vests, the flag, the flag stand, yeah. But we, in terms of the t-shirts, that's the global, that's global, global that sponsorship, the yeah, global sponsorship. and they come from yeah. the UK. Yeah, we just have to pay for shipping. Thank you. Just um, my next question is just regarding the signage with your closing remarks. It, it sounded like you said something along the lines of we said you couldn't have a sign. Um, yeah. Can yeah. you elaborate oh, on okay. that? Because I'm, I'm um, not quite sure what that's about. <laughs> so I sent a letter in um, some months ago, actually, it was May. Um, and um, first of all, the answer was yes, we could have a sign. And then um, we were working with Sportman or two at the time as well. And then it come back, no, actually that was wrong. You can't have a sign because the rules are that we can't have um, signs on the river pathway um, because if you had one, then all these other clubs and organisations would want them. And so basically was told that if you, if you want a sign, you need to come and do a presentation. So who, who was the letter sent to? Was it an elected member or was it staff? Uh, can you help me, Brad? Uh, it was staff. Sorry. So it was initially staff, um, parks staff, and okay. then came to us uh, with, in consultation with one of the councillors. <laughs> Okay. Actually, uh, now that I recall, uh, and my initial contact was with um, Councillor Pat Hancock, so I, I, I may have sent it to him and he may have forwarded it, but as I said, it's May and I'm old. <laughs> I Aaron, can still run, I just can't remember. Uh, Aaron from Parks and Reserves said, Aaron, do you want to make a comment? I think I more likely would have gone to Jason. Jason is... Um, generally deals with the river. We've dealt with Jason before in terms of getting the limestone area put in. Okay, but the the, the final um, part of that conversation was that this, if you wanted a sign, you had to come to the council chamber and do a presentation to elected members to get a sign. Yeah, to get policy changed is is why I understood it. Okay, okay, thank you. Councillor Harper. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. I wondered if I could get a comment from officers about the policy for the River Park framework and just to see if it is about getting a policy change. 
I know the general manager or the infrastructure office, and uh, what's the title? Sarah. Chief Infrastructure Officer isn't here, but um, so if we could get a comment on whether it needs a policy change or what, what is the um, process? Uh, good morning, Bryce Hosking, Acting Chief Infrastructure Officer. Um, probably the simplest answer would be I'll, I'll go away and we'll investigate exactly what needs to happen and come back to you. Have you got a date when you can get back to us? Because this has, I think, been swimming around in the water for quite a while. We can come back later this week. Okay, thank you so much, Bryce. Online, Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thanks, uh, <coughs> thanks, Mr Chair, and uh, thanks, Karen and Wendy, for, uh, for coming in to uh, talk to us today. Um, just really, just quickly, just in terms of um, the signage that you're talking about, I believe that's kind of a standard sign, which is... Um, uh, Park Run News uh, globally, is that correct? No. Part of the sign is, but the sign that we saw up there, the the um, that's Pororo. That's Pororo. That that's was yeah, their own one, and that and that was their own sort of. Um, it was in two halves. You got your Park Run bit at the bottom, and then the top half was their own picture. And I would envisage that we've already got signs down in the river that say uh, share the path, and I would imagine that the um, graphics would be similar to that with the park run part that we need on there as well. So, so dimensions, you would say, uh, perhaps, what, a metre by a metre or something similar? Yes. Um, you know, we're open negotiation about that. It's just something that, as people maybe are cycling by, um, they can read, because I know that um, when I'm running down there, um, a lot of the wording, especially the bit that says share the path, is quite small and a cyclist um, would be hard pressed to actually read that at, at the speed some of them go. The ones that you really need need to read it um, probably can't. And also hoping that it will explain the reason why that big square limestone area is there. In the, you know, it's a bit random square limestone area in the middle of nowhere and a lot of people ask what it's for. So having a sign to say park run 8 a.m. Saturday morning with the website on it will explain what we're doing there. Yeah, great. I actually thought the uh, limestone was uh, for uh, bulls or something similar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it could be. Signage, it I, could be multi-purpose. The signage would be just adjacent to the limestone area would be suitable. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are my questions, and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing the uh, response back from officers in due course. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karen and Wendy. Um, that's the end of questions. Um, Thank you. Appreciate Thanks for the opportunity. In and uh, sharing that with us. Thank sorry, point much. of order, Mr. Chair. I was late jumping back in the. Oh, sorry, Councillor Ben Barrett has just come back in. <laughs> Thanks. Councillor Barrett. No, thank you. Um, and thank you, Karen. Thank you, Wendy. A um, couple brief questions. One is to understand. Um, what else you are doing or have thought of doing by way of signage to kind of flag to users that there is an event on at the time of the event. I guess my my kind of comparator is um, when I go down there and the striders are doing something, I think I'm going into a construction zone from kind of five kilometers out. Um, is there anything done by way of signage or well, heads up to people? We uh, have a flag that we put up and take down uh, each Saturday morning. It's just one of those Teardrop. Teardrop flags, yeah. That, that says park run on it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's basically all we have. And a marshal at the turnaround, so that's, yeah. that's all we yeah. have. Yeah. And that's at the time of the event. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, my other question was just kind of your views around capacity of that space. If you had twice as many people show up, would it still work? If you know, how, how big can it get in that space? The limestone area would easily take that many more people. Uh, it was interesting, one time we went down there and they were building a pump track and it finished right in front of the limestone area. Mm. And um, so I had a quick word to the guys doing it and they said, oh, we don't know anything about that, but maybe we could just angle it a bit towards uh, the limestone area. So they've done that. But if we had double the people, then it would probably be good to perhaps just extend that limestone on an angle so that we can start everyone on there and not put them on the path to start them. But at the moment, it's not safe because you trip. When you go on the grass area, it's quite uneven. I myself rolled my ankle one day when I was trying to go past people. 
Um, so, yeah, we, we actually try to keep them off the grass when we start them. So they are all on the path at the time that we start. But if we had an angled start, then we could not have them on the path while they're waiting to go, and they could also spread out. Yeah. Um, yes. Great. Thank you both. Okay. Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Sorry, can I just say one more thing? If you do agree to have a sign, could we please be um, involved in how it's going to be worded. That would more than likely happen, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Councillor Harper. Sorry, Mr Chair. Just coming back into that after that last comment, um, just about booking the space and whether there's double bookings on the same space at the same time, is that a problem for a sportman or two or is it a problem for... I mean, when the space is booked at the same time, how do we know that? How do we talk that through when the space is used at the same time from two different codes? I don't know who answers the question. In the almost five years we've been going, we've never, that's never, um, we've never come, haven't never come across it where we are. Um, we've been there when the new Relay for Life, but they're a little bit further down. So our turnaround and has been, and they've been on the grass, but we've never, because we're 8 o'clock in the morning, I think, because we're early, we're usually packed up and gone with nothing left behind before anybody else comes down when there have been some other events down there. OK. The, yeah. other, yeah. the other aspect is that because Palmerston North is relatively small, a lot of people are multifunctional in that Wendy's a strider, we're both Moa Harriers, um, so there's a lot of other people that do park run that are in other codes as well. So, yeah, um, it's never ever been an issue for us. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Karen. Wendy, um, really appreciate you coming in and sharing with us. Um, it'll be taken forward and um, we'll watch the space to see what happens. Thanks so um, yeah. Once again, I want to commend yourselves and your volunteers, because in this day and age, it's very hard to get volunteers, so um, well done. Some weeks it's like pulling hen's teeth, but we get there. We always seem to get there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. I'll move the recommendations that uh, the Play Recreation and Sports Committee receive the presentation for information. Seconder, uh, Councillor Naylor. And um, any comment, councillors? Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Um, I, I guess probably the uh, comment really is to, that um, I, I guess the um, that this is probably evidence of uh, of our own success in terms of, uh, I guess, trying to manage sort of the numbers of people down uh, using the uh, the river pathway. Uh, but I suppose the only thing which I would like to note perhaps is or, or just uh, query is, uh, just adding the, um, the the report back to uh, the work schedule. Uh, thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Just wanted to briefly thank um, Karen and Wendy for um, all the work that they're doing around Park Run. It's, it's just fantastic that as a community we have grassroots, flax roots, fully community-led, and enthusiastically enjoyed um, recreation opportunities coming into, especially coming into the river space where we have invested um, for a long time. And as somebody who occasionally is willing to get out of bed at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, um, it is fantastic to have those sort of community-oriented um, activities there. Really great that it's um, worked through COVID and is still with us and, and going strong. So. Yeah, just a big thanks to you as directors of it and to all the volunteers um, especially, and we'll see what we can do about a sign. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Harpeter. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chair. Just very quickly, just wanted to say again congrats to Park Run and to the directors, but um, just looking forward to that um, commentary for the policy because I think that's probably the key issue for this. There's nothing real really else about this, if there's any other issues, just the policy change for the sign. So thanks very much, and thanks to the officers for following that up for us. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, I'll ask you to vote, please.
and that is passed unanimously. Um, now it brings us on to item number six on the agenda, presentation from Sport Manawa 2, um, and ask Brad Cassidy. Brad, you know the run of this, so uh, ready when you are. Uh, kia ora koutou, um, Mordena, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, come and present a state of play update. Um, this context to the report that you received, or hopefully you've read, um, we'll take it as read, but um, uh, our annual report uh, is not due um, back to council until the 31st of August, so obviously this was really the last opportunity for us to um, beat our chests in front of the councillors before the hard mahi starts, um, leading into October. But um, by way of introductions, I'd just uh, formally like to introduce uh, our Sport Manawatu Board Chair, Nathan Hopcroft, to the table. Um, he he'll introduce himself, I'm, I'm sure, before we um, cut into the report. I will take the report as read. Um, however, there are just probably four points that we'd like to elaborate on as part of our um, seven minutes, or should I say six and a half minutes. Thanks, Brad. I'm Nathan, as Brad said, um, Chair of uh, Spawn One or Two, so I've been in the role for uh, just under 12 months, but um, prior to that, six years on the board, so I've a um, fair bit of background with what we do and um, also interactions with Council, so thank you for the opportunity today. Um, first, um, or one or four we're going to talk to is strategic partnership agreement. So of course we've, um, this last really six months has been an opportunity for us um, to review the last two and a half years of mahi um, that we've looked to contribute to um, council outcomes. So of course our focus areas are council's goals um, and then what fall out of that are, uh, are the outcomes. Now um, part of those um, do drop out of the active communities um, strategy, but there's obviously things like the um, cycling and walking um, outcomes that fall out of the um, the urban master plan, cycling master plan. Of course, we've got um, events there, which is outcome two. Um, with that, uh, there are a number of activities that drop out of those outcomes that you see as part of the um, the partnership agreement. But obviously, it's great that um, we've been able to um, identify what we want to do over the next three years and um, we'll hope to present a, an update on, well, really the six months. I, th I think we'll present our final report for the last agreement in November, December, and then it'll be time to, um, to provide an update on the latest in January, February. I'll get Nathan to, to talk to this point. Yeah, sort of uh, live the strategic plan for too long, really. We the original goal was to have the uh, strategic plan finalised in July 2020. Um, COVID starting sort of late in our consultation period was a spinner in the works and um, us really taking stock for a good period of time with cha huge changes to the underlying environment, but especially um, sporting and active recreation space. Uh, we'd already been through a process of stakeholder engagement, so it was um, timely then, I guess, with those changes to have a further period of stakeholder engagement. Um, also a reasonably new board group from October last year and then more recently um, resignation of Trevor as CE. So we took each opportunity to um, keep reviewing to make sure the document was fit for purpose. Um, but we're there, um, you yeah, sort of lived and breathed this for a long period of time. But um, we're really happy with the outcome, acknowledging um, a lot of um, comments from a wide ranging group of stakeholders who um, who we partner with. So um, to me, um, everything written in there is important to us, but what I wanted to highlight particularly was the final strategic priority, which is um, active capability uplift, um, he pekingi uh, order. Um, in that, it was, we did the, the work on the strategic plan was done, but um, that recognise that we've, we've got reserves there, Sport or two as well, and a lot of you around the table will know that um, we were looking to, to partner and do Sports House together. Um, through the strategic plan process, we've recognised that 
that bricks and mortar approach in a changed environment wasn't how we wanted to um, prioritise our reserves. So um, what, what we've set with now is um, us actually using those reserves for what we deem to be good, um, like an internal application process for us as um, board members and from the team and the community to actually um, use the money as a bit, of, bit of a carrot rather than typically be reactive to um, funds because we're reliant on our funders. It should give us some money um, ahead of the game to um, do good with and then um, potentially look for funding after that. So we can actually get on the proactive side. Um, it will only be a small amount each year. We're talking potentially 50,000 a year because we want to be able to do it year on year, year on year through the investment of our core reserves. So um, we're going to make sure we're for, uh, financially sustainable, uh, especially for me, board chair. I don't want to take opportunities away from future board groups as well. So we've got to be careful with our funds, but also recognise that we can do better than what we're doing now by just having those funds um, sitting there targeted for a sports house. So quite a shift in our thinking that way. So um, won't be any more sports house conversations now with this uh, current board group too. So um, we've been there, done that. So we're going to move on and, and try to do some good. So I think for me and the board group, it's really um, exciting. So we're there. Great. And as context, the, um, the board signed off this um, strategy Monday last week. So in effect, this... Uh, paper of all the um, the strategy will be disseminated via email to um, to members um, post um, report update um, two more slides to go I guess this here's a big big um, uh, I guess the emphasis this year is on the review RSFP review obviously at the moment we're still reviewing the uh, PNCC components of the strategy uh, that's I know there's a, an update on that as one of the other items um, which we can um, talk to but I guess the, the key for us is just making sure that you understand the process to date so we've got a closed tender out for this um, review um, stakeholder representatives in terms of who's sitting around the table. We've mixed it up um, this time round rather than it's just um, um, council uh, representatives. We've got funders around sitting around that table so they understand the process um, and our national uh, funders. Uh, we've also got, um, um, I, I would argue, our Māori voices around the table so rather than um, one point of contact there, and we do want to make sure that it's engagement, not consultation, um, as part of this process. Um, in terms of key deliverable, uh, key deliverables, I've outlined some within the report, but I guess the time frame is is just making sure that um, we've got um, an updated version of this um, report and is ready to go um, come 1st of July 2023. Uh, last but not least is um, sporting events. Um, the first time that I'm aware of in the last six, seven years that the fund is, ex is exhausted by six weeks into the new year. Um, I think a, a large part of this uh, are sports and groups wanting to come back following two quite um, strenuous and stressful um, years on the sector. Um, so we're really excited about the opportunities in front of us for the next um, 11 and a bit months, or should I say 10 and a bit months. Um, but I think the big thing there around the Sports Event Partnership Fund is the economic benefit to the city. Um, all going well, and, um, and we are able to deliver and support those events um, in the city. Um, this is what our, our city will benefit in terms of economic benefit. So um, that concludes the presentation. Um, Nathan's happy to uh, answer your questions. We have uh, a first question from Councillor Hancock. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr Chair, and uh, th thank you uh, both for the uh, presentation. Just curious, just in terms of uh, page 14 of your report there, you talk about the loss of the Colgate Games and then talking about um, the hospitality stakeholders need to assess and address possible capacity issues in terms of accommodation. Um, can you tell us what work's being done in that space and is anybody taking the lead on it, please? Yeah, sure. So um, with effect, I believe last Friday, um, the panel, the Sports Event Partnership panel met to um, confirm 
the last of the projects that we could support based on what funding was available through Sports Event Partnership Fund. As a result of that, uh, we've got a new panel member representing CEDA, and so part of that discussion um, referred back to the, um, the concerns we had around Colgate Games, um, what um, issues we felt, anecdotal of course, felt in terms of um, accommodation um, challenges. Um, so there's a bit of work that's been done already by CEDA. Um, so at this stage, um, in, in collaboration with Council Representative, um, we will find out or we'll have a better picture uh, within the next few weeks around what that looks like for us um, here in the city. We're conscious that whilst it's all good and well for us to secure events such as volleyball, which attracts 1,800 participants, uh, that's excluding supporters we can take up to two and a half thousand people here in the city uh, would we have the provision in place so again very much anecdotal and we're using the Colgate um, example to test some of our thinking so that we we've we've got that the, um, the accuracy within the information to make a, a investor decision or informed decision going forward Right, thanks, uh, right, uh, Mr. Chair. <coughs> uh, the Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, uh, guys, for the report. Um, during COVID, obviously the fund wasn't spent. Where did you bank that money, or what happened to that money? Yeah, so um, that money was um, actually uh, part of our agreement um, under our. Um, strategic partnership agreement is that if that money isn't spent, it's rightfully returned back to council. So I believe there's about 135,000 that, um, that was not used or consumed for events during that period. Um, we um, proposed a retaining 55K of that uh, to transfer into this financial year, the purpose being that we knew we were gonna have a bounce back there were going to be a number of different events and event um, facilitators, coordinators putting their hand up to say we would like uh, to deliver, we would need some support to be able to deliver. So gratefully or thankfully the council, this council approved that 55k. So we get 265k annually. So with the bolster of the, the 55k of course that's increased that. Uh, that lifts the, le left the remaining money from that 135 that goes back to council in the um, operational pool, I understand. Can I ask officers where it went? Did it just go into the general account? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Just a second question. Um, you know, <clears throat> we've, you know I, I got the Colgate Games debacle first hand um, and it was evident that um, people in this chamber, the right hand wasn't talking to the left hand. How do we, do you think a calendar, a collaborative calendar of events where it is fed in by venues but also different offices organising things? Yeah, good point, and um, yeah, absolutely. I think we've identified through the process that actually the, the it is um, it's really important. I, if I go back, I think there's a bit of work. There's a great deal of work's been done in the funding and support policy area, and that sort of that that's consumed a lot of our our, our time. But it provides a mechanism for us to be able to make decisions on what we can and what we can't support. I guess in this case, what we're looking at from an operational model is. How we and how we improve the way that um, we share information and the share calendar was on point. Um, and in fairness, um, council um, staff um, have worked on that, so that's currently in place. Um, we've got to do our part to put in the events that we've agreed to uh, in this financial year, and that's going to give us a really good picture of where those potential conflicts exist and where the pressures are going to be on on our accommodation sector. Yeah, but Brad, do, do do the public see that? You know, I mean, we have a lot of administrators that sure you know, got cycling um, cycling at the moment, looking at things, and I don't think anybody 
outside a couple of elected members probably know what's going on there. Yeah, look, I, I can't answer that. I could say that the year there's definitely benefits to that. It's um, it would be sitting with um, with the developer of that shared calendar right. and but, potentially to explore future options. But do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so councillors will be aware that last week we launched a new um, strategy in this space, uh, a City and Business Events Advisory Panel. Um, so we are currently in the process of seeking uh, volunteers for that group. The intent is that group will involve um, PNCC officers, Sport Manor 2 will be part of the mix, uh, CEDA, accommodation providers, venues, um, to try and get ahead of some of these issues and to also provide a forum where we can uh, share a calendar to um, to highlight things before they arrive, like this issue with the Colgate game. And, and look, sorry, Mr. Chair. And look, do, do, do the do the public or some of the, you know, the administrators, the organisers of these events, do they feed into that as well? That is the intent. So my my area um, has quite a good oversight of what's happening within the city through managing parks bookings and also with an overview over some of the funding pools. So. Um, we always have the issue of if we don't know, we don't know. Um, so, with this group, that that helps us with you know keep keeping our knowledge base up to date and and rounded, so we can feed these issues back to places like Sport Manu or Two and the venues and accommodation providers. Thank you, Councillor Harper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Nathan and Brad. Um, just a question around your. You brought up about the review of the joint um, facilities plan. H who's on that review panel? Or can you just share a little bit about that review? Yeah, sure. Um, so if we're looking at re as specific representatives, we've got um, a representative from this council or from Palmerston North City Council and Marie Mori. Um, Horofanua District Council, Sh Sean Hester. Um, Rangi Tike District Council, Joe Manuel. Uh, we've got Sport Whanganui, who is an extension of um, Whanganui District Council, uh, NZCT, um, National Manager, um, ECCT, uh, Funding Advisor. Um, we have um, Ihi Aotearoa, uh, Senior Consultant, Spaces and Places Consultant. Um, Tatihi, our representative, uh, or representatives, um, Horizons Regional Council. Um, uh, Ewe Partnership Manager. So the point of the review is? Uh, update our current um, strategy um, to ensure that it reflects the changing environment and that the investment decision making per, uh, process fit for purpose as to how we uh, make decisions and support the projects that get presented to this table. So even though the funding decisions are made by individual councils, Yep, so the decision making ultimately comes back to um, councils to make that, but what we, um, to make those decisions, but what we want to be strong on is the, the voices who we're generally trying to support. So when we look at the voices, it's the end users. Okay, so it's a policy. I'm just trying to understand the, the purpose of the review. I, I really, I'm unclear of what the purpose of the review is of the strategy is to review the current regional sport facility plan. So at the moment it's a plan over seven TAs. We still want to retain that one regional approach, but it's likely that we're going to focus on efforts of separating between, um, if I use the Rangatiki um, Awa, um, Sport Whanganui looking after or servicing the districts to the north, and Sport Manawa Two servicing the councils um, to the south. Um, the pr I don't believe our role will change in being able to support council and working between council and proponent groups of looking at regional facilities, but crucially, how we determine what facilities we support into the future. So one last question, Mr Chair. Who's funding the review? Uh, it's co funding is coming from the parties involved within the within the um, steering group, so it's the, the councils involved. And um, one of those funders has also indicated that they are contributing to 
or two, sorry, including Ihi Aotearoa. So how much is the review costing? Um, well, at this stage, there's parameters because it's still under a tender process. So you can't tell us? No. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and thanks, um, Nathan. Thanks, Brad. Just had a question around the Event Partnership Fund, um, and there's a note there around um, nine multi-year agreements already sitting within there. And I'd like to understand if there's a, a view around kind of what proportion of that fund should sit kind of in multi-year long-term frameworks and how much of it should be responsive. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we've, we've had this conversation um, a number of times. I guess what we generally fall back to is the, um, is the criteria. And number one on the criteria list is economic benefit to the city. So when we're looking at those larger scale events, eight of those nine um, are probably the highest um, earners back to, this, to the city. The exception is Ethkick. But we know what Ethkick does and, and what it contributes to in terms of the city. We have to be really careful is if we exhaust the fund at the beginning of the year, then attraction has disappears. So we might as well remove that out of the picture. Um, I don't think that's a, a, a something that this council would be too happy with. And so as part of our response to that um, is that each year we have to ideally give ourselves a position that we can look to attract an event. And that's why it's really important with the panel members because they sit across different um, panels mm. um, and also different funds. So is there a, a criteria or a policy kind of around how much of it sits in multi-year and how much of it sits... There's a terms of reference that we use as part of the group, but I think part of um, why... And I, I have to go back in to the, the support and funding policy for a start. That's the guideline document that determines how we govern um, the, or administer this particular fund. I guess we're in a unique situation is that the policy doesn't determine what our cap is, whereas the other funds that you have are capped as far as I'm aware. So um, that, that in some ways leads us to be a bit more flexible in, in how we um, attract or be able to retain events that are significant to the city. If there was a cap, we're potentially likely to lose some of those uh, long-term multi-year events. Right, thanks for those answers and comments, Mr Chair. Thank you, uh, Brad and Nathan. Really appreciate your, your time and uh, the update. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, I'd just like to move the recommendation that uh, the Play Recreation and Sports Committee receive the presentation for information. Seconded by Councillor Harpeter. I now open up for comments. The Mayor. Thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Look, um, thanks to Nathan and Brad for the uh, presentation. I think it sort of segues nicely into some of our other reports a bit later. But uh, um, it's, it's good to just highlight the, the stresses that are there. Um, and I think simply writing checks isn't the, isn't the way to do things. But uh, I think it was alluded that uh, we, need, we need to be a bit smarter around the calendar. And it's great that um, that work has started. I think not every event organiser or promoter is looking for uh, event funding either. Sometimes it's on a rotation. Uh, they come here, and I know of um, several, I think even the Colgate Games was sort of part of that. But unfortunate that we don't get it again because I think it's on a 10 or 12 year rotation. But um, it's only when a venue is, is booked that it starts to trigger a bit of activity um, within this organisation and also with Sportman or two. So I really do think that calendar needs to be a bit more public. Um, and you know, we've got some key players in the room that feed into that. Um, I do think we're under a little bit of stress and pressure around what will happen. Perhaps a bit disappointing that the um, the disused funds went back into the, the council um, uh, general account, um, and, uh, and, I, and I know the reasons why, so I won't go into that. But 
uh, we'll now find ourselves in a little bit of um, uh, prioritisation on what we look at. Um, we have uh, Hawke's Bay and Tauranga especially that are looking at what we've done with um, secondary schools and multi-year events and uh, they're looking to fill some of their uh, venues that aren't as well utilised as ours. So we need to, we need to make sure that we um, um, confirm our, our home base and make sure we're doing the best we possibly can. But uh, thanks to Sportman or two, just for signalling what's on the horizon. So it's wise for the new council just to take that note of that as, as budgets and annual plans come up. Thank you. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr Chair. Uh, just a brief comment around the um, joint facilities um, plan, which has been sitting on our agenda, I would say, for probably nearly three or five years. So it's been sitting there for quite a long time. I kind of feel like um, it has been sitting in the washing machine and it, it does need to be um, come out and give it a really good shake. So I, I do think that um, transparency around this process is needed. So we do need to know what's going on as elected members. Um, it's good to hear it as having a review, but as one council to a party of it, of was it seven councils, we are only one party to it and we are paying money into that. So as elected members, we just need to know what's going on. Just want to signal that. Thank you. Councillor Denison. Thank you, Mr Chair. I would also just echo Councillor Harpeter's um, concern around the regional sports facility plan. It's been around for five years, and I know that we've had one, but it's been very basic. The review seems endless, and I'd love it to give us a, um, a, a um, reference where we can actually have aquatics groups and hockey turfs and all the other stuff that come through, um, a measure to say are we going to um, invest in it or not and um, it's put a whole bunch of projects in limbo because we all reference back, oh, we've got to wait for the outcome of the regional facility plan. <laughs> so I'd love to have a date on that. And so just echoing again Councillor Harpeter's um, comments. The other one I just wanted to jump on is the Mayor's um, concern around, um, or not concern so much, but point around the, the money that we invest into the event partnership fund is so well worth it. And I guess Sport Money would do too would have done a lot more with the extra money if they kept it to get the economic benefit with all these events that are coming on stream. And, um, you know, there's powerlifting, there's, I saw some of these other sports, blow carts, um, wheelchair basketball, that are bringing events here that are sizable. But you look on that right hand column on page 15 the economic benefits into the tens and into the hundreds of thousands of dollars for our city. And so um, every bit of investment in that space, I just see it's just so powerful because we don't have lakes, we don't have vineyards. What people come here and visit Palmerston North mainly is because of events. And these age group sports tournaments or national events are our prime um, attribute, I guess, that we should be investing in. And so I just really want to emphasise the fact that there's a lot of value in these things. And um, I guess we don't get to review that again until the next annual budget, but keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, uh, Brad and Nathan, thank you. Appreciate your work. Um, I'll ask you now, councillors, to vote, please. That is passed unanimously. That brings us to number seven on our uh, agenda. Presentation by Mr. Jacob Oram, Massey University, Sports Advancement Manager. Jacob is online, I believe. Yes, I, yes kia ora koutou. Can I be heard and seen, hopefully? Yes, you can. Yep. Welcome, Jacob. Uh, fire on Hi. ahead. Yeah, it's, I just noticed it's a little bit dark. Oh, no, there we go. If I lean in, there's some light. Um, I am coming in from home today um, under the weather a little bit, so um, hopefully I can work out sharing my screen as well. So bear with, I have emailed it as well to, to Rosa that hopefully if this doesn't work, we can get it up via her as well. So here we go. Um, Can 
Can you see it? Yes, yes, it's up, Jacob. Oh, brilliant. Okay. I am not very technical, not very good with my technology. So, okay. So I don't, I, what I'll do is I'm aware that everyone can read. So what I'll do is I'll just sort of highlight a few of these bullet points. And then I'll obviously this is my first time at one of these um, council meetings, to be fair. So I'm aware there are questions at the end, which potentially is where the specific information can come out and be, be teased out from this presentation. So um, just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, obviously on a fantastic facility, recreation facility based down there at, at Mass University and, and one that I know a lot of the community uses. So I'll, I'll, I'll make my way through this presentation. So I wanted just to start with an overview of, of, our, of our governance and operation for those who weren't quite aware. So we've got three parties, uh, Massey, which is myself, uh, Gary Mack, who's grounds, and Ron Werner, who's recreation uh, manager. Um, we have obviously council, we have councillor Petronas and then also Aaron Phillips. Uh, in the user group, which consists of George McConaughey, Alan Adam Adamson, and Jordan Peters, although Jordan is is departing the Manawatu, so he will be replaced in time. Um, just a brief couple of bullet points there about operations. So we re-signed an MOU between the three parties last year. Um, so thank you very much to council for that. Um, Massey and the council contribute financially to the budget. That is split equally, well, not equally, I should say, but it is split between uh, money that goes towards uh, operating costs and then also asset renewal and and if you know anything about artificial surfaces they are expensive so there's a large chunk of that annual contribution that goes towards asset renewal. Uh, Massey's responsibility, I've just listed a few there, basically we try to, I'll delete the word try, we maintain the facility and Gary Mack and his team do it very well so that's everything from outside the turf with regards to the grass embankments, the shade shelters, the internal field for football and, and the throwing uh, athletic sports, um, as well as um, related to the turf around the edges. And, and if, you know, we do get moss and the like um, growing on it, so maintaining that facility. We also take all the bookings and communicate that out to schools and other stakeholders who book the facility. So that's Massey's responsibility. Um, and throw in there, you know, if you can imagine, say, the, the larger schools in the area bringing in 500, a thousand, you know, if you're talking the high schools, um, the traffic management and security around that. So quite a big operation on those days. Exciting days, mind you. A lot of buzz around campus when those days are happening. Uh, and then the, um, I put there the athletics club. It should be user group, but um, the user group basically uh, everything to do with uh, the equipment hire, um, the renewal of that, the, re the the repair, the replacement of it if it needs to be done. And also George is brilliant at basically making sure on these athletics days. Um, for schools, he's down there early setting it up, helping them, unlocking, making sure the gear is there and accessible for them. So uh, the user group, uh, obviously the more hands-on athletics specific tasks. Um, I had a couple of, basically I wanted to have a couple of subheadings for the slides I had. Um, COVID, obviously the lockdowns, everyone's aware of those. Thankfully, they fell kind of outside the athletic season, which was handy. Um, which is around about September to March. So it looks like there's crossover and there was right at the start. Uh, so right at the end of 2020 and right at the end of 2021. So um, I suppose you can say uh, we got lucky in terms of the MCAT facility use with those lockdowns. Uh, event can cancellation um, around COVID. I mean, there were some major events that were cancelled, but every sport, every organisation, um, every business was was hindered by COVID and the lockdown, so so we can't complain. We did our best. The school athletics days were the major ones and our regular ones, and obviously our community, which the track is there for, and that was disappointing. I mean, in terms of the recovery coming out of that, if I skip down to the, the third bullet point, down rescheduling of those. So we did what we could. We were very flexible with our communication and, and extending the invitations for our local schools to come and use it. Um, primarily term four, I suppose for the younger schools, um, we then transferred into, um, you know, at a later date. So we're able to accommodate most. I can't say all. They still either postponed or fully cancelled, but it is what it is with COVID. Um, uh, the big thing was was adhering, obviously, to the government uh, regulations and, and protocols, and that was done uh, through, you know, bubbles and social distancing, cleaning. Uh, we had, until the QR code really got going, we had um, staff down there, either, either through Massey or the user group, uh, taking names, registering participants, uh, and just making sure that um, there is a record of, of participants and attendees. And you'll see there on the right-hand side of that, um, of that, uh, of your, your screen, that 
we updated our information board, uh, which included obviously a QR code down the bottom right there, so that it was made everything a lot easier and a lot smoother. Um, and that seemed to go down really well. And that was placed at a couple of locations at the tracks, so it was easy for uh, visiting people to make use of. Um, so the, the big part is obviously community use. I mean, it is called the Manawatu Community Athletics Track. And I just wanted to highlight some of the users. Um, I've just got general community there to start. I mean, that is miscellaneous. Very hard to put numbers on that if you just want to go down and have a walk or a run around the track. Um, uh, but obviously that is a big part of it. And I know actually in a previous life, I used to go down there if I had some running to do myself. So um, that is obviously well and truly used, although we can't provide set numbers on that given that it is, uh, you know, just walk on up and, and away you go. Uh, and obviously regional and nat national athletics events. I know the Colgate Games was already mentioned. Um, that actually comes up in a, a further slide, but um, that is a general community where we're able to not only get locally here in the Manawatu, but further afield uh, you know, the wider central region, obviously nationally as well. A Mass University, we, we do run uh, a couple of sort of club days or student engagement days, activation days down at the track, not a huge amount annually, but a couple of times we've done that and we've been down there and made use of the facility and what it has um, and just making sure that if there are, I suppose, larger events down there, high profile, bigger ticket events down there, that we communicate that out to our wider community so that if they want to go and watch, I was going to say take part, but probably not really. But if they want to go watch and be a part of a spectacle like that, the event, that that is open to them as well. So we utilise communication channels for that. Um, central football and slash Massey football. So the obviously the the field inside that, which is, I think I, th I think I can record, it's not quite large enough for a say a, a you know a FIFA or a, a top level size pitch, but it is it's there for training, primarily used for training at the moment. So you'll see there on the slide that. There are three trainings a week. They are under lights. Um, the lights down there, I have been told by football users, are sensational, um, and hence why it is it is often used down there. The the problem is, I suppose, and again, it will come up in a, in a further slide, is the turf isn't quite where it needs to be, and it doesn't marry up with the quality of the lights. So that's why there aren't so many games, and you'll see there that there's only a handful of games um, per season, just because at the end of the day, the football needs to stay on the ground, and if the ground's not quite up to standards, then um, you can't play too many fixtures there. So that's where it is with football. Um, going over to the next slide around community. So obviously the, the user group or the Athletic and Harrier Club is the, is the main user. And obviously they make use of it very well. And it's a very strong and successful club with some very good people involved in it. Um, their season, as I said before, I got it wrong. It wasn't September, it's October through to March. Um, Tuesday's their big night, their big club night, although George McConaughey let me know that basically every day they're down there, the club is down there using it in some capacity, formally or informally, and their age break age breakdown is split. Um, he said very evenly, 25% basically across those age groups. I don't actually have um, total numbers. Uh, I mean, percentages could be anything, um, but I uh, the total numbers I don't have, but it is spread evenly, which I think is pretty cool, showing that it's, it's right down to the young kids learning how to move uh, being active, being healthy, um, trying to be fit right up to obviously your high performing athletes. And finally there around schools. Um, so I, I've mentioned a couple of times, all one or two schools uh, have one athletics day free of charge. Um, there are some schools uh, that have uh, multiple days and, and that is a user pays thing. Um, but we get, you know, if we have a good, good summer weather and where my office is at the Sport and Rugby Institute, um, and actually, Nathan and Brad mentioned the sports house before. I thought there was a segue to me coming in there, actually, with the SRI. Um, but my office at the SRI, um, you know, and there's there's great noise, actually. And on a good day with my back door office open, and um, uh, there's some really good noise coming out of there. And it's, it's great to see the buses pulling up and all the kids filing along to take part. Uh, so really good buzz on campus, a good vibe. Um, and the schools hire the equipment, and that's basically where the cost comes in. And, and the roundabout is that that cost is not a profit. That just goes into, as I said before, the, the user group renewing, repairing, replacing equipment for further use further down the line. Um, next couple of slides, and I hope they're big enough, I'm sorry, um, uh, just around some community use. Now, this is from last year, and you'll see in April it says zero. That is incorrect. Um, that is a typo, so apologies for that. Um, now, I've got to say that these are based on bookings. That does not mean much like during COVID with actually 
uh, well, the opposite actually around participants. Uh, no one is down there actually counting people going in. This comes from the numbers that come through in the booking system and the booking sheets. So they could vary, absolutely. Um, but the, here are the, the numbers we are looking at and you can see the sort of peaks and troughs, although they're not huge, huge because you've got obviously athletic season and then during the winter, you've got use um, primarily around football. Um, so it, it's spread out nice and evenly. And I think that shows that it's not just a summer facility. Um, and it's not just an athletics facility. There is some use throughout the year as well with football. Um, uh, but it is, as I say before, it is nice to see a, a, an even spread. So it's not kind of dormant during certain months of the year. Um, last couple of slides. So this is just a continuation again from last year. This will show you the bookings per month based on the, um, the user groups. Again, hope you can see that. I can't, and I've got to print it off in front of me. Um, but around the Athletics Club is obviously the huge one. Um, and that's just with their club nights, other events, um, you know, weekends, that sort of thing. Uh, massive clubs, as I said before, utilize it um, and you work your way down there. The big one there, and I was actually really interested um, in this, is Intermediates only had one last year, again, a COVID affected year. And that's really interesting to me that, that there was only one Intermediate. Now, maybe that is that particular school feeding it wrong into the booking system, I don't know, but I was very interested with that. Um, and if you look, look over there to the users per month, um, you can see already that high schools might have been, um, you know, mid-table when it came to the bookings per month. But you obviously look at the numbers of student athletes coming through and, and, and they're right up there with the athletic club in terms of users per month. Um, so I just wanted to provide a snapshot there on last year, even though it was COVID affected, you're still looking at some serious numbers going through that recreation facility, which is great. Um, and lastly, was around the future. Um, so I've just got there around some events we've got coming up. Um, halfway down the list there, there's the Colgate Games. No need to keep going on about that. I know it's, I have been listening in. That is unfortunately come and gone. Um, and over to uh, Whanganui. And interesting talking to the user group yesterday. It was we had a meeting. Um, I don't know if it's all the accommodation situation is much better over in Whanganui, from what I understand. So um, uh, yeah, anyway, next time. Um, but yeah, I won't go through those events, but there's, those are kind of the big ticket items. I've thrown in there as well, the secondary school cross country championships, which are next June. That's actually based more on the Sport and Rugby Institute uh, fields and out to the back to the farmlands. But there is contingency to possibly go down in and around that area. Um, and if any of you have children who have taken part, I don't have it up there in the Tough Guy Girl Challenge. Um, that goes down into the athletics track, not on the athletics track as such, but in and around there, especially with a massively large, hellishly dangerous, oh no, I didn't say that, uh, slip and slide going down the embankment, um, you know, and the kids have a fantastic time. And we had, I think it was nearly 2,000 primary and intermediate kids take part in that um, this year. Uh, and Massey University is a, is a partner of the event organisers, uh, but they also make use of that, that facility as well. So we're able to get a lot of a lot of bodies and a lot of eyeballs going down there and just increasing the visibility of that facility. Uh, lastly, looking forward, I've just put down some um, some interesting points here is around diversity. So uh, we are a and if you sat around our committee meeting, you'd you'd pretty work out what demographic we are. And so I have put out a request to, to all the user groups around um, increasing that diversity, and that will happen at our November next November meeting. We will be having a couple of changes, as that is just where we need to go 100%. So that is something that Massey is driving and will be adhered to. Um, ATV fundraising, that, that's that's a big thing for the user group. That's just for transporting. That's obviously a, you know side by side or a a vehicle to transport, especially the high jump mats, which are, are, are extremely heavy, and other equipment with their with their trolleys and trailers. Uh, field drainage works, as I said before, just to improve the quality of that, that facility in the middle. Um, the lights are outstanding. If we can get that to a point where that, that the turf is outstanding as well, we could, I actually think it would be a great facility. Um, changing rooms, I've been told, are also an issue, but let's just small steps at a time. You know, that could actually be a really cool area for football or potentially even rugby going forward. Um, uh, Thank you, Jacob. That's um, that's our that's our ten minutes and a little bit minutes. plus. But yes. um, we'd like to uh, offer some questions to uh, councillors, if that's okay. That is fine. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor. 
And my apologies, Mr Chair. My question was around the lack of diversity on the uh, eight-man advisory board, but that's been addressed. Yes, if I can make comment on that, and I'll just confirm that that has been well and truly addressed and that will change. And I'm on enough committees internally and externally at Massey and you know, completely away from Massey, full stop. And that needs to happen and it will happen. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Butt. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank, thank you, Jacob, for your presentation. When you talk about matching lighting quality, are you, can you hear me? I can absolutely, I'm actually trying to, there you go. Okay. Am I still, I'm trying to work out how to get rid of the presentation, but continue, apologies. All right. So when, when you talk about matching lighting quality with the, with the grounds quality, how, how big is that project? I mean, bringing um, it up to the standards. Well, the light, I wish if Gary Mack was here, with, was here with me right now. The, as far as I'm aware, the, the, the turf is probably the lower hanging fruit compared to the lighting. And then the lighting is a debate whether we go to just a, a simple, re, um, you know, let's call them normal bulbs. Um, or LEDs, and LEDs are, you know, you're talking four or five times more expensive, I think. Um, I, I would need to find the numbers out, but yeah, a lot, lot more expensive. Um, but the turf is uh, probably, as I say, the lower hanging fruit and something that I would need to get confirmation on from our grounds manager before making too big a comment there. All right, thank you, Mr Chair. All right. Councillor Dennison. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jacob. The... Um, Future Works program with the light bulbs and then the ground turfs and whatever other improvements you were looking at, mm -hmm. the funding intention, where would you be seeking that? Is that a council council looking to contribute towards that or is there other grants or other contributions Massey are looking to invest? Yeah, that is, that is something we would look Probably well, at all options, absolutely. Um, but we also obviously have our capital works projects in Massey as well, Group One, Group Two, um, and we would look, you know, as we have done in the past, look for um, funding internally, um, primarily, but obviously talk to um, you know, Aaron and Councillor Petronas as well to see what avenues are, are, are open there. But I know it's something that Gary has um, thought about and discussed within his team within our. Um, facilities management, but as of yet, I don't have an answer for you about where exactly that funding will come from. And again, it'll come down to, I know, I know that from our committee meeting yesterday, and this is where we're at with it in terms of lighting, Gary was going to source um, from uh, a local company here the, the difference in price between just a rebulb, a relamp, I should say, and LEDs. Yeah, thank you for those yeah, comments, uh, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the lights still work. We currently do not have any lights out. And in fact, a few years ago, we had two of the four, and this is how expensive it is, we had two of the four um, rebulbed, relamped, um, but we obviously need to do the further two. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, there's no more questions. Um, really appreciate you coming online and taking the time to present to us. Um, That's right. It's really good to hear from thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Cheers, thank you. Councillors, I'll move the uh, recommendation. Uh, the committee receives the presentation for information. Second, uh, the Deputy Mayor. Any comments? The Mayor. Thanks, Mr Chair. Look, um, thank you, Jake. Um, I actually pushed to try and get this a bit more public because uh, it's, a, it's an important uh, facility and, you know, we although Bruno, uh, sorry, Councillor Petrinus, um, uh, sits on that group for us um, and, and from time to time gives us a heads up on what's going on. We don't have a huge amount of oversight over it, but it's a real good cost, sorry, a good example of cost sharing between joint venture partners um, mm. and, and especially with our, 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 one of our major partners, Massey. If we were to do this ourselves separately, what a burden that would be on the ratepayer. Um, or simply the university. So I think um, you know, it just shows the benefits of working together. Um, getting the new track laid several years ago was a major, and um, you know, um, it was great that that, was, that sort of work was done mainly by Massey, but evident that there's a real maintenance program there and uh, forward-leaning forward, um, as well. 
And while we're exploring this regional facilities plan, um, which will come up shortly, I think this, this track's a genuine community facility. It's being well utilised from the grassroots, um, and if we didn't have it as a city, we'd be a lot poorer for it. You know, 20, over 21,000 users, community users each year, and year round too. You know, from younger kids um, competing to the high schools, um, you know, the club users, um, obviously the uh, Palmerston North Club's the, one of the bigger ones um, using it, uh, Massey, and then you've got events. A you know, training facility for, for other codes, for teams and individuals. But look, I just want to acknowledge formally Massey um, for the work that they've done. Uh, we often don't get the opportunity to do that. So, um, Jacob, please pass on our thanks to the Vice-Chancellor and, and others um, and your team for um, what, is, what is a really, really great joint venture um, project and facility with the university. Thank you. Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, councillors. Uh, there's no further comments. Uh, once again, thank you, Jacob. I really appreciate you coming in and uh, uh, sorry, coming online and, and sharing with us. And as uh, the mayor has pointed out, um, there's great value in the community track and the work Massey do. Thank you, councillors. I'd ask you to vote. And that is passed unanimously. Thank you. We're going to take a small adjournment now, and uh, we'll be back at 10.50.
Welcome back. Uh, next item on our agenda is confirmation of the minutes. Um, item number eight, page 21 of your agenda. Um, I'll look to move the minutes, seconded by uh, Councillor Harper. Anybody wish to comment on the minutes? No, excellent. I'll ask you to vote. And that is passed. Ten votes for and one abstention. Item number nine on the agenda is the play policy annual implementation and monitoring report presented by Julie MacDonald. Thank you, Julie. Kia ora koutou. I'm very happy to present this first um, report about the play policy implementation. It was only adopted last year um, after a very disrupted process with COVID lockdowns and the like. Um, it represents a, quite a shift in thinking for the council and a different approach to how we might go about operational um, processes. So um, definitely a work in progress. Um, Anne-Marie Moray, who's done this work, is unavailable today um, for both the reports here. So we will, um, with the help of my colleagues, we will muddle through. So the main progress I think that's been noted in this report is um, activities in parks and recreation facilities and services, um, and also through Sport Manawatu's um, increased focus on play. I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the nice infographic, um, Shakota Cox from Sport Manawatu, who's here today, um, who particularly focused on um, Tamariki in Manawatu, rather than Pumas North, but Manawatu, that's um, appended as um, part of this report. So the next step is a more deliberate implementation plan across council, looking at areas where there's opportunity for more improvement um, throughout the organisation. There's obviously a resource component of some of that work, um, but the report gives a comprehensive view of, of what's happened to date, and, um, and we, between us, are happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Any questions, councillors? It appears not, Julie. It appears that uh, none. Oh, sorry, Councillor Hancock has just come in. Councillor Hancock. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks, Julie. Just a very quick question, just around um, Play Street. Uh, Waka Kotahi, uh, there is a little bit of work going on there around uh, managing um, uh, street closures. Just wondering if there's actually any update on that at this point in time. It might be the most um, useful process to get an answer to that would be to put something through councillor request um, so that we can get some specific advice back to you on that. I don't have any update right now. Thank you. I'll uh, put something through. Thank you. Mr Chair. Thank you, Julie. There appears to be no more questions. Um, so the recommendation is and the committee, committee received the memorandum titled Play Policy, Annual Implementation and Monitoring Report for Information. I will look to move that, seconded by Councillor Harper. Is there any comments, councillors? No, we'll look to put that to the vote. Thank you. <coughs> Passed, 11 votes for, none against. Item number 10 on our agenda. Uh, sports facility planning update. Review of the Palmerston North section of the Manawatu Wanganui Sports Facility Plan 
and feasibility assessment. And the covered bowling green and an artificial football turf. Um, presented by Julian McDonald and Brad Cassidy. Assisted by Brad Cassidy. Kia ora. Apologies for the longest report title in the world. Um, so the purpose of this report is to, is to provide a very brief update on these programmes funded in the 2021-22 year, so coming to an end now. I would notice, um, note that the timing is really to do with the last Play Recon Sport Committee of this um, triennium, so um, I realise that we are kind of sort of coming to say to you these things are about to happen, um, but also note that they will be reported through committee processes and brought through to the 10-year plan thinking. Um, this report also provides a reminder about the investment making process that Council has agreed to and I just wanted to make a note in response perhaps to the earlier questions about the um, Regional Sports Facility Plan. Um, that was only adopted in 2018. It does provide a very high level strategic framework at the regional level as, as Brad discussed. Um, it, it also acknowledges that local planning and code specific planning is still needed and that's what this council through the 10 year plan made a lot of provision for in terms of those pieces of work that are reported here but are still upcoming in terms of pools and indoor courts. Um, so, so there's a lot of work underway, there's quite an extensive program and um, this report talks about the, the city specific part of the review of that framework. Happy to answer any questions. Councillor Finlay. Thank you. Chair, um, <coughs> just reading this report, and I suppose it's a bit like a broken record really for me, but we've had some submissions, and um, this is a little bit outside parameters, but still. Um, <coughs> we have uh, the football turf, and we've got the um, covered bowling area, but one of the sports that seems to have been forgotten in the city, well, since the 60s, is that of Olympic swimming. Uh, we've had submissions come to us asking us if we could look at an Olympic pool on the way to the... the um, I'm about to get into do, do, do we have, at any stage, any long-term plan or discussions about having a, an Olympic acceptable pool here in Palmerston North or the Manawatu? There is a Pulse facility piece of work planned that's beginning this year. Sorry, could you repeat that? There is a piece of work about Pulse's needs in the city planned for this year. There is budget for that in the 10-year plan. When will we see that coming out? you know a date? Once it's been completed. It's a piece of research that is only funded from this year. OK, so we won't see it probably until next year at least. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Naylor. Thank you. Um, just in terms of the review of the um, regional sports facilities plan, I mean, we've had some discussion about that earlier. Um, um, the framework that's outlined at the top of page 40 of the you know, concept outline, preliminary feasibility, um, detailed feasibility, then business case, um, at what point does the funding or affordability um, get applied to the framework or considered? Or is that a part of the framework in any way? It is part of the framework and there's actually another, um, it's a one-pager document that actually, it's a stop-go. And it's, I think we've, we've included it with another report. Um, I, I can release that, but yes, essentially you're getting to certain points where you go, is it a go or is it a stop? and it relates to investment decisions. Yep, and I, do, I think I do recall that being presented to us before. So when I guess what I'm trying to get my head around is, if it's regional and there's other funders, um, how is affordability determined when we're just one partner? So that would be part of the, that business case discussion. So I, I guess we're talking about what is it, you know, should, should it be a this, that, or another thing, and then how would it be achieved? So those are different decisions, um, because as we know, there is an awful lot of pressure from a variety of codes for new facilities. This is in no way an assumption that council is heading down a path to develop or fund any particular facility. What it's doing is saying that in order to work out what the decision on that should be is to, is to do all the homework up front, rather than start at the let's have a whatever it is, and then, and then go looking for funding. 
Okay, so just to tease that out a little bit more, I guess there's quite a bit of investment involved in progressing an idea right through these four phases. If it's simply unaffordable, is that investment warranted? Um, or like, is that something that's determined in the earlier stages rather than just waiting to the business case, which is the fourth stage of that? Yeah, absolutely, and that's a really good point. I guess what what E Aotearoa, who effectively have supported um, development thirteen, soon to be fourteen regional sport facility plans across the country, and the reason why that was done is that there are some um, facilities that have been invested in that. Um, are costing money, and and uh, they're really costing ratepayers uh, money, and so the idea of the plans were to prevent um, those same mistakes happening. So whilst we might argue yes, there is initial upfront costs, those upfront costs are not going to uh, ideally uh, impact on ratepayers for the future. And what we want to be able to make sure is that the facilities that we build now are going to be fit for purpose for the future. That's providing that um, that those uh, that the information stacks up to support the development in principle. Yeah. Um, when you get to the feasibility, detailed feasibility phase, that's where we start to examine what are the different funding models, who's contributing to those, what does it look like. Um, because I guess the thing is that um, some sports are, are, are well off, and other sports aren't well off, but we know that sports contribute to the fabric of our community and this is where the decision-making fabric becomes critical when we've got multiple projects on the go and the crux is what projects do we support and how will we support them. Okay, thank you, that's really helpful. We have no further questions, so thank you both very much. Uh, the recommendation on the screen, councillors, <clears throat> that the committee receives a memorandum titled Sports Facility Planning Update, View of Palmerston North Sector of the Manawatu Wanganui Regional Sports Facility Plan and Feasibility Assessment for a Covered Bowling Green and an Artificial Football Turf for information. I'll look to move that. Seconded by Councillor Harpera. Any comment, councillors? Uh, Mayor Smith. Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, um, thanks to um, officers and, and, and Brad for um, presenting this. I think, I think also, although it's really healthy to have this wider plan and I'm a big supporter of it, there is a couple of, and it was teased out by a couple of questions, there is a couple of items here uh, which has been sitting in the plan for some years. Uh, one of those is actually the um, artificial um, or covered bowling green. And uh, they would have come to us, I don't know how many times, and submitted. And, uh, it, and we, we, I think we do have to make some progress where possible on that. I think it's, um, it's pretty obvious with clubs um, merging together, amalgamating, that they're going a long way towards themselves um, at, uh, at raising money and coming together. I think it's only beholden on the council that uh, uh, we should be doing the same. So just a, a word that... I'd hate to see us wait forever um, for this plan and, and then we almost immediately would tick off a bowling green. Um, so just want to put it out there that um, those sort of projects um, probably should be coming sooner rather than later. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Harper. Um, thank you. Just again, keeping it short, I know why the purpose of having a sports um, facility plan and why we've got it and <clears throat> that we have been waiting for our final one since 2019. But um, again, just to hold up these major projects because of it is a real frustration for our community. So I, I just think along the lines of what the Mayor said, that we should be just bowling on and trying to get, I don't want to do that analogy, but going on and trying to get Fine. that... Um, get these for their needs and, and I think Councillor Finlay said it for, also for aquatics. We have got groups, which is what Brad said, we have got groups that in our community that do need things and we might need to do them ahead of our sports facilities plan. Sometimes we have to crack it, the egg, 
instead of actually waiting for the plan. Hey. <clears throat> um, I'd just like to come in and also echo what's been said by the Mayor and Councillor Harpeter, that there's programs that people have come and, uh, and projects and asked support and help with, and it's just gone on and on. It seems to always get directed back to the feasibility um, plan. And um, look, to be honest, bowls, their grandchildren are gonna be playing by the time they actually get any further process on it. And I just think it's something we really need to, to move on with. Um, Councillor Dennison. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I was going to maybe bring a little bit of um, perspective in the fact that um, each, it seems like this meeting is just a couple of months too early because like the theme for today, everything's just about to happen. Uh, the uh, work's completed by the end of August in one aspect and in the the bowling and the uh, football turf, it's expected to be ended of September to get these reports finalised. So while we've got an update in the new term, I'm expecting the outcome of those updates. And uh, so, yeah, bring it on. It's just, it's been, <laughs> I, I sense that frustration because I feel it too, but um, I do recognise that they're pending. So, thank you. Thank you. There's uh, no further comments. So I will ask you to vote, please. That has passed 12 votes for, none against. Uh, the last item on our agenda is the committee work schedule, and I'll hand over to uh, Cheryl Bright. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Chair. Just a um, one thing of note, the first item around the play policy annual report uh, just needs to stay on the work schedule with a change of year to 2023, so we don't lose sight of that. Um, otherwise, I have nothing further to add on the other items. Thank you. Is there any other comments? Councillor Finlay. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, we heard from staff today that the aquatics <coughs> report should be coming up sometime next year. Just to keep an eye on that, could we please place that on the, uh, on the schedule so we can get, keep an eye on it and see where it's at? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Dennison. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Question, just in regards to that last report with the covered bowling green report coming um, end of September um, being completed and the artificial football turf, will they come into the new term and can we, they be also noted on the work schedule? Um, anything that you want arising from these, works, uh, these reports that you want specifically on the work schedule, um, raising it in this forum is totally appropriate and can actually go on the work schedule from here. So that's, that's fine. Yeah, I, well, I would, I would um, catch a theme and I'm, uh, I, Definitely. I've picked up this general interest um, on all those three reports, actually, the facility plan, the covered green and the artificial turf, those pending reports, if they could be noted to come back. Thank you. There's uh, no further comment or questions, so I'll look to move the recommendation. I have a seconder, Councillor Naylor, and uh, I'd ask you to vote, please. That has passed 12 votes for, none against. And that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting. I will close. Thank you all for your attendance.